following. Specifically, we're going to now jump into um, a very brief look at uh, agent-based and individual-based models for communicable disease modeling, uh, transmission modeling. We only have about 25 minutes, and this is a topic that is close to my heart. It's one I know and love. It's one I teach, you know, uh, full week-long courses on worldwide, and it's one um, that is central to our research activity and our research activity at this nexus of system science and data science. But it's one that I'm going to have to be um, uh, extraordinarily circumspect in exploring uh, with us today. Um, but given the vote we saw earlier, I'll have that whole module on this for those who would like to come much further. And by the end of that, you'll be able to build your own textured models of, um, of infectious disease transmission, um, observe their dynamics, record the data from them, um, and, um, and try different uh, what-if scenarios with those models uh, in ways that will be enabling. Um, but let's, let's dive into uh, the very basics here. So I'm going to turn to two sets of slides, which I have shared with you. Um, uh, not one day thence um, on, the, uh, on the site. So if you want to uh, go to the Canvas site, you can find the, the essentially two, two, two decks, uh, excuse me, I, I showed the first of them. Um, I don't know if we'll have time for the second year, probably, probably not. Um, so I want to talk about agent-based models. Agent-based models um, are individual level depictions of one or more populations. Um, where each such population is associated with some um, persistent characteristics we call parameters, um, um, uh, associated with uh, a, uh, a state. Um, so each agent has some evolving state. It could be as simple as their age, uh, but it might be uh, their infection status or their attitude with respect to care seeking or their mental health, um, uh, some measure of mental, mental health or quality of life, smoking status, some actions for evolving that agent over time and some rules that govern under what condition those actions uh, transpire or, or, or triggered. Um, and I'm gonna have to uh, lower this, uh, uh, this little window here. Um, and they have critically, and this is absolutely central to the, to the motivations for agent-based modeling, they have means of interacting with other, uh, with other agents um, and with the broader environment. So they're placed in some, situ they're situated in some context. There's a time horizon and, and characteristics of that and, and some initial state. So in, the, in our model, we'll have a definition of a population and the simulation, when we simulate the model, we'll, we'll have all these different agents. Um, and uh, these agents will be associated with, with these characteristics. They'll be heterogeneous typically, which is much vastly easier, more scalable to, to attain within an agent-based model than in a compartmental model. Um, and uh, you know, each individual agent therefore will have different characteristics. These characteristics can include continuous heterogeneity in a way that's not feasible to capture in an ordinary differential equation model. One would need a, a PDE model, a, a partial differential equation model. Now, um, these individuals could have uh, state and, and there's many ways of depicting the state. One of the more popular ways is with what are called state charts which like a stock and flow diagram, depict at once three types of things. Two wet, um, the set of possible states. Two, the, um, the rules uh, by which, uh, or the, the actions by which the state evolves. In the stock and flow model, we have um, flows. Here we have um, the, um, these transitions. And three, the conditions under which um, uh, those, uh, those actions take place. Uh, and indeed that's uh, indicated here with these icons. Um, we're, we're not gonna go into the semiotics of the iconography right now, but that will be a central part of our, of our tutorial. Um, and suffice it to say that actions can be triggered by many things, including um, 
uh, things like uh, a rate of transition, a chance per unit time, just like you see in, in compartmental modeling, some fixed amount of time, or the action of another agent uh, or some other asynchronous uh, feature, say the enactment of a policy or what have you. Um, so this might indicate, for example, someone going from the infectious to the recovered state that they're exposed to infection by another agent. And generally speaking, agents will have um, many types of semi-orthogonal types of evolving state. Uh, so maybe with respect to infection and with respect to care seeking or with respect to their mental health and all three might be evolving simultaneously in a way that's loosely coupled. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, here, what we see is a situation where we've almost taken compartmental modeling um, and um, stood it on its, uh, on its side or, or its, uh, on its head, as it were, per Hegel. Um, so uh, if we have uh, aggregate stock and flow modeling, of course, we divided up the population into a set of uh, state variables or stocks, right? Susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. They're subdivided according to their, to their state and their, their characteristics. If we needed to distinguish male susceptibles from female susceptibles, male exposed from female exposed, we would have separate stocks for male and separate stocks for females, um, maybe reflecting different care-seeking patterns or different likelihoods of asymptomicity of people being asymptomatic. Each stock in a stock and flow model uh, as we've seen, counts the number of people who are in that, have that condition, that set of characteristics, that, that situation, right? We count the number at any one time or susceptible. We count the number who are infected. By contrast, agent-based modeling flips this on its head. Instead of subdividing the model according to the state or characteristics, we subdivide it according to individuals, individual actors. Those are the units of agent-based modeling, not stocks and flows, but individual actors. And each stock and flow keeps track of what state they're in and their characteristics. With the stock and flow model, we divide it up into these characteristics and uh, you know, the data that they were, were keeping track of were the number of people in them. In an agent-based modeling, uh, we have the structure of the population is based on individuals, um, but each individual keeps track of their state uh, where there's no kind of overall repository of state. Instead, it's distributed among these, these different individuals. Um, now, when it comes to uh, different levels, say uh, a family context or a neighborhood context or a regional, you know, a city municipal or regional context, um, uh, it, we can represent that using a stock and flow model, um, but it's, it's a little bit awkward. They're all at the kind of same horizontal level of the model. Um, uh, and relationships between different units, say between males and females, or between people in different cities to each other is captured in say mixing matrices. With agent-based modeling, we have nested contexts. So we might have uh, representation of a city. And within the city might be uh, agents representing uh, different uh, schools, different long-term care facilities, and different, uh, uh, different families, for example. Um, uh, and so we have this kind of nesting of the model and agent-based uh, models that is kind of mirrors situation in the world. Um, we further put these, uh, these actors, these uh, individuals into context. These are situated agents. They are situated in a particular context um, uh, and they're affected often in a local way by that context. So we may put them in a network, for example, um, uh, and we may put them in a spatial context. Um, and this gives rise to patterns in uh, stock and flow modeling, in, in modeling with, uh, with state, state equations, um, as we've been exploring with compartmental models. Um, uh, we have uh, patterns that emerge over time, right? Um, we have um, these, the growth and fall of a number of infectives in a closed population. 
um, we have it oscillating towards an endemic equilibrium and an open population. We have rich emergent behavior over time. Here in an agent-based model, we have it emerging over time to be sure, as shown here, down here, totaling up the number that are in different states of infection here for a chronic wasting disease model with prions, um, prion spread from, you guessed it, deer. Um, but we also have patterns that emerge over space or over networks, for example, which can be awfully very, often very rich, um, uh, very thought provoking, um, and can be analogized to say patterns over space we see in certain types of diseases like rabies um, or the spread from Wuhan to Hubei and to other major cities uh, in China um, within the opening weeks of the, uh, the pandemic as people fled uh, Wuhan and, um, and went to uh, nearby cities in Hubei or, or, or elsewhere around, around China. Um, it bears noting that these members are uh, heterogeneous. Um, so we might have, for example, physicians interacting with, uh, with uh, um, people in the population where you have individuals in the population and networks with family members and physicians in networks with individual population, uh, population members based on um, uh, care delivery, uh, for example. Um, uh, okay, so you can have spread of infection in ways that reveals patterns in the network. Say the gray here, recovered people, the green um, uh, people not yet infected where um, someone's horizontal position is dictated by their socioeconomic position. So wealthier people have fewer connections reflecting less crowded housing, better protection, ability to work from home, um, telecommuting whereas uh, lower socioeconomic groups have denser infection. And you see patterns emerging in the spread of infection within this context that disproportionately disadvantages um, those uh, the lower SES group. And by putting people in network context, we can have a uh, spread of infection. This is actually a hybrid model where each individual dynamics, their viral dynamics are simulated by a stock and flow model, a system dynamics model, a compartmental model, and where the infection spreads across a population in what we call an immunoepidemiological way um, to, infect, um, to infect others. Now, in contrast to the compartmental models that we've been dealing with, which are most commonly formulated in a um, deterministic paradigm, meaning there's, uh, we, we write our, our differential equations um, without involving stochastics that would yield stochastic differential equations. They're instead, you know, ordinary first order differential equations. ABMs are typically stochastic. So it reflects the fact that at an individual level, behavior is rarely um, deterministic. There are exceptions. Uh, Conway's Game of Life, uh, classic cellular automata, for example, is deterministic. But by and large, in, in, in the infectious disease sphere, agent-based models are almost invariably stochastic. That is, they incorporate randomness over time. Um, and reflecting this to ensure that model results aren't, aren't flukes, that when we run the model, we're not just getting some chance, you know, edge event, um, uh, the infection dies out, whereas most of the time it would stay, it would stay, you know, firmly established um, endemically. We run the model many times. And so we run what are called Monte Carlo ensembles of the, of the model. We, we run it maybe 50 times or 100 times to, to understand the regularities across all these runs. And stochastics here are, are not merely a a shortcoming, they're an asset. We can, by observing variability across these runs, we can also often understand variability seen in real world data, explain variability of real world data, where it comes from in ways that require, that can move us beyond guessing. Um, we can say, oh, that's the sort of variability we, we would see in this context. Um, you know, It's not an indication of a deep trend, but just the the variability that's to be expected, uh, for example. So a single run might net you uh, a certain cumulative number of, of infections above 
for, amongst um, low socioeconomic groups and high socioeconomic groups. This is kind of a, a histogram of sorts. Um, and might net you a certain number of high SES cases uh, over time of infection and low SES. But if we run the model many times, we'll see there's actually a distribution. Um, and uh, there's a distribution as to how many people in the low SES group are infected as of time 600. Um, or um, the number of people in the high SES. But by and large, the high SES has much less chance of having, say, a thousand people infected than does the low SES group. And at the at the final time, if we if we look at the total cumulative number of infections that have occurred, um, it'll vary between model runs. Sometimes we get um, about uh, two thousand. Sometimes we get um, rather more. Um, and but by and large, there's a uh, a difference. Uh, the low SES groups tend to have a greater propensity for, they have a risk of much higher levels of infection, but there's still a significant fraction of them. Uh, and as it turns out of, of high SES cases where they have no infections at all. Um, so it's kind of a bimodal situation. Um, okay, so um, uh, I will further say that when it comes to agent-based models, per my earlier comments, it's easy to build ABMs, and those who will come to my tutorials on this can easily encounter cases where we'll build ABMs with multiple levels of context. This is a sort of uh, example we build in our boot camps where we have you know, cities connected with transport networks, and within each city, you might have um, a scale-free infection network of people that are connected up to each other that are in a, in a manner that can lead to infection transmission. And we have people sometimes moving between nearby cities um, and they can bring the infection with them to a new city, for example. Um, this is a nested context model. It's a hierarchical model. We have cities, we have the overall population at the top level and then cities at the next level down. And within each city, we have uh, people. Um, and we have different networks at the different scales. And this is very easy to, uh, um, to create within agent-based models. It's very natural to create because within the model, we have the same sort of nesting we do in the, in the real world. And we can have agents to represent a school or represent a neighborhood or, or to represent a, uh, uh, a you know, long-term care facility where those facilities might undertake processes, uh, screening or, or testing or, um, or undertake vaccination um, and therefore be represented as agents. Um, time is running down. So I, I just want to you know, leave you with some understanding of why would you use one of these compared to compartmental. Um, uh, having used both these forms extensively over the course of my career, um, uh, for, for roughly 30 years, um, uh, somewhat more for, for, for ABMs. Um, I will just say that, uh, uh, that these are highly complementary techniques. Each provides uh, strengths that are not shared by the other. Each provides unique insights and opportunities. ABMs, if we were to enumerate their strengths, um, we would list them as follows. Um, uh, they can capture continuous and discrete heterogeneity. We can target interventions, for example, on people who are uh, uh, who have a history of infect a certain history of infection or vaccination. We can capture that that historical context or people who are disadvantaged or or, or people in a certain geographic region or in certain network contexts, say hubs of infection. Um, and uh, we can examine the effects of our interventions, for example, across different groups of heterogeneity. We can represent networks, context, multi-level um, nesting. We can capture it decision-making, um, say a person to get vaccinated based on what's happening right around them. 
I call it situated decision making, right? It's, it's based on the number of people they know who have become infected or have gotten, uh, gotten vaccinated as well. Um, uh, the fact that we can capture longitudinal information on a person, their, be, their, their evolution over time, um, is really important not only for the interventions, as I mentioned earlier, but for calibrating the data against longitudinal data we may have from the world. Um, we can use it uh, to, to better understand model dynamics um, and indeed to better characterize the dynamics of the model um, within its um, within its formulation. Um, it allows us to uh, more precisely capture intervention effects and implementation science issues of interventions. You know, how they're actually implemented and rolled out beyond how they're designed or who they target, although it can be rich there as well. And visualization of the sort we've seen, these kind of spatial maps, uh, these depictions of networks, um, uh, depictions of uh, people flowing through a facility can aid communication and intuition. Um, and finally, um, and this is really important for data science, these sort of models form this potent, um, and I would argue formidable source of synthetic ground truth. What I mean by this is that with so many data science techniques, um, we have uh, patterns that we may see from the world that we'd like, to, um, we'd like to use to try to formulate more general rules, but we're not sure what their blind spots are. We're not sure where they're strong and where they break down. We're not sure under what conditions they hold or why we see these patterns. And using an ABM, we can produce very readily from these individual agents, pretty much any sort of data we can collect from the world, from individuals, we could collect from a kind of an ABM that we built. And we can use that data because we know the true situation in the ABM. We know how many people are truly infected at any time, or we know what people have been more grievously reinfected in the model or have had worse outcomes. Um, we have a kind of God's eye view of this ABM state. We can use it to kind of test our data science tools, our inference tools, our tools for keeping models in sync with an underlying system to identify those blind spots, to identify why the patterns we see um, are likely working so well or identify cases where they may, um, may cease to uh, offer advantages going forward. Um, so we, we can use those to formulate study designs um, and inference methods. And you know, in general, there's this trade-off. Um, these days, it's more a matter of combining the two artfully and in a judicious way. Um, but individual-based models do provide uh, support for highly targeted planning. Um, the ability to calibrate to, validate off of, and, and, and compare to, uh, and produce synthetic data. Um, we can have uh, heterogeneity, flex you know, greater flexibility representing heterogeneity and adding to the heterogeneity and evolving what we capture within a model and capturing finer grain consequences. Um, aggregate models, by contrast, uh, the sort of models that we have at compartmental models, they provide easier construction often, calibration, parameterization. They are the tool for formal analysis and understanding the general patterns we see under a wide variety of different conditions. For example, identifying under what conditions we expect um, our equilibria to be stable, under what conditions we can count on endemicity to be uh, occurring or avoided. Um, they're, they're cheaper to run, they have lower baseline costs, they have smaller state space, which is important for many types of inference. And um, the fact that we can construct them quickly and iterate with them allows for more time to be spent on understanding and refining such models. Each of these provides a key tool within the system science and the dynamic modeling toolbox. Each of them will, will play a role within this course in terms of helping to enable uh, some of the techniques and helping to judge some of the techniques. Um, 
And uh, for those who are interested in learning more about individual based models or their particular agent based model um, instantiation, I'll look forward to meeting with many of you um, uh, who have expressed interest uh, in uh, coming weeks to do that. So um, those are all my formal comments for today. Um, as normal, I'll hold office hours now and would be uh, delighted to, to talk with any uh, who, are, who are interested in discussing um, any of the topics from this lecture, topics more generally, projects, et cetera. Uh, I will ask for the courtesy of a five minute break and we'll be back uh, shortly. Thank you very much.